Thank you for coming here today. Uh, I'm obviously here trying to promote my book. Uh, it just came out uh, a couple weeks ago. I'm very excited about it. Uh, I keep on running out of the copies I have, and I find that the, that the books that come from Princeton to here are delivered by Oxcart. So you should order the Kindle version, which you can get immediately. Um, but I'm a big fan of the book because it was a real fun research project for me. And it, oops, so this is the wrong direction for me to walk into. Um, and it was a uh, it was really driven by an experience I had. Uh, there, I, I posted a, a blog at the SIPS blog uh, over the weekend about how I fell into this project. And I really did fall into it. I wasn't looking to understand this stuff. Uh, it does harken back to some of the things that got me into grad school in the first place, but I sort of got distracted by ethnic conflict for more than a decade. Um, and so that's where my research agenda went. But I've always been interested in alliances, I've always been interested in civil military relations. And so when I had the opportunity to, be, to have a fellowship that put me on the U.S. Joint Staff in the Pentagon, the U.S. Joint Staff is the part of the U.S. military that is essentially the nexus between the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, and everybody else, whether that's the CIA, the National Security Council, State Department, NATO, embassies, Everybody else, this is a real nexus. And uh, I happen to have been placed in the Bosnia desk. And in my first week, uh, Bosnia was still the show in Washington, D.C. Uh, Kosovo was still the show. It was the major foreign policy, uh, major defense commitment the United States was facing at that moment in time. Uh, and what was interesting was there was a professor from the National War College who came over to our building. Uh, oh, came over to our, our office and said, here, I'm going to do NATO 101. I'm going to teach you the basics of NATO. And we're like, well, we know what NATO is. We, we see it on the news all the time, and we were working about it. But he actually revealed some stuff that helped to open up my imagination of, of, of uh, questions about NATO. And indeed, my first week in the Pentagon, I asked things like, well, what are the French doing in their sector of Bosnia? And the answer that I received from the folks, you know, the, the experts, the, the folks in the U.S. military who have been studying and working on Bosnia, their answer to what the French are doing in Bosnia was, they shrugged their shoulders. They didn't know. Uh, and so this, uh, this led to some questions. And then when I left the Pentagon after that year, uh, I had to finish up my previous work. And so I only got to, into this project around 2006, 2007. And by that point in time, the issue was no longer about thinking about comparing Bosnia to Kosovo, but trying to understand Afghanistan. Because the NATO commitment, the NATO effort in Afghanistan, uh, in size and money and cost and politics and everything else, was much greater. Uh, for the alliance than anything before. So what I want to do today is explain a little bit about some of the basic uh, comparisons and contrasts across NATO, provide uh, some conventional wisdoms that I want to uh, combat, and then explain our, the way we try to seek to explain NATO. Uh, and the first thing is, is in Canada, there is a myth that Canada was alone that Canada was alone in Kandahar, that the experiences that Canada had in Afghanistan were unique to Canada. And while Canada is exceptional in many, many ways, almost everything that happened in Canada and Afghanistan happened to other NATO countries. Uh, so for instance, Canada had multiple opportunities to think about staying, and that led to politics in Ottawa, and led to temporary boosts in coverage by the media about the mission in 2006, 2008, and then even more or less in 2011 as we're pulling out, and then replacing the mission with a training mission. Uh, the Dutch had really interesting politics about this. They spent an entire year the first time around trying to figure out whether to go or not. Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty about that. So in 2005, 2006, they, there was a lot of uncertainty. They had an extension of the mission. Then in 2010, their government collapsed because they couldn't agree to stick around. Uh, Germany had an, uh, extension votes every year. The Danes had extension votes every couple years. This was not just a Canadian thing. Second, pretty much everybody who went into Afghanistan underestimated the threat and overestimated their capability, capability to deal with the threat with the forces they had. They all wanted to go in with as small a force as possible because that would mean that they could save money. Maybe their militaries didn't have that much capability, whatever, but everybody sort of didn't think it was going to be that hard. And everybody was wrong. Uh, Canada was not the only one who, uh, who underestimated how difficult it would be in southern Afghanistan. The Dutch underestimated it. The British underestimated it. The Australians underestimated it. The, everybody who went there underestimated it. Third, we had our detainee controversy in this country. Everybody faced the exact same problem. Counterinsurgency requires you to occasionally arrest people, much more so than 
ordinary peacekeeping. You though in Bosnia and Kosovo, you would arrest people and you would put them in where? The American prison, because the Americans always had more capacity and could build a prison. Uh, but after Guantanamo, after Abu Ghraib, that was no longer a policy option. The problem in Afghanistan, of course, is that the Afghans didn't have a history of treating their prisoners particularly well. But Canada wasn't the only ones to try to figure this out. The British had problems with this, the Australians had problems with it, the Dutch had problems with this. Everybody faced the same conundrum. In fact, the Americans are facing that conundrum this week as Karzai has decided to release 33 folks who are accused of pretty significant cr crimes, and he's just releasing them rather than uh, trying them. So this has been a, a, an ongoing problem, not just a Canadian thing. Uh, the real heart of the matter, and one of the problems that caused a lot of friction with the NATO, was that everybody had a spot. There are only a couple of uh, actors in Afghanistan that actually looked at Afghanistan as a country. The Afghan government, the United States, because the United States had troops pretty much everywhere, and the Taliban. Every other country was focused on a spot. So Canada thinks it was alone in Kandahar. If you take a look at all the Canadian documents from the time period, it's all about Kandahar from 2006-2011. The, 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 the British had a helmet action plan. The Danes had a separate helmet action plan. The, the Dutch had an Oresgon plan. Everybody focused on their hunk of territory because that's the way it worked. NATO distributed responsibilities by area of operation. And so countries tended to focus very much on their spot. So it lended really the, to an idea that there's not one war in Afghanistan, but 20 plus wars, or 30 plus wars, depending on how many countries you're counting. In the Canadian conversation, and this is a problem that was replicated elsewhere, the whole of government effort after the Manly panel focused on these benchmarks. So you could, get a, you could go online, you can still find these quarterly reports about what we were achieving in Kandahar. Uh, 50 schools, a dam, polio vaccinations, and a bunch of other stuff. That was the Canadian focus. That was the focus of the folks at, at DFAE. The focus of NATO was on fighting a war. And the connections between the war and the objectives, the checklist, were often not so well connected. Anyway, so that's the general pitch that Canada wasn't alone, a lot of problems were, were shared. The second thing I want to talk about, and this is going to lead into the larger discussion about alliance politics, is that there's a belief that coalitions of the willing are easier than alliances, that NATO gets a lot of criticism because you have to get things through Brussels, you have to get consensus to make decisions that involves getting 29 countries or so to agree not to disagree. Consensus doesn't mean that everybody has to love something, it just means that nobody objects. But that's a difficult process. And so after every NATO mission, there's a temptation to go, hey, let's not do it with NATO. Let's do it with a coalition of the willing. Much easier. The problem is that coalitions have the exact same problem as NATO, but more so. That is, when the United States went into, Afghan uh, went into Iraq with a coalition of the willing, everybody was willing, right? The British were willing, the Australians were willing, the Japanese were willing, but the Spaniards were willing. Yeah, they're willing to show up, but they were not all equally willing to do everything the United States wanted them to do. So uh, when the Americans wanted the, the uh, Spanish to confront the, the, the Shiites, the Spaniards said, no thank you. Uh, there are countries that were operating in Iraq that weren't even allowed to uh, guard their own bases. They had to stay in their own bases and have somebody else guard them. So a lot of the restrictions and caveats that are the focus of the book are not just about Afghanistan, they're not just about NATO, they were present in Iraq, they were actually present in NATO during the Cold War, they are present essentially during World War II. These kinds of problems always happen when you have more than one country operating on a battlefield together because allies never just throw away their sovereignty, they will always uh, exert control of the military. So the problems that we, th we see in Afghanistan are true for any coalition of the willing. The second uh, hit the wrong button, and now my thing's not moving. There we go. Uh, thank you. Uh, the second thing is, is that one thing that NATO is, is it's deeply institutionalized. And people complain about the institutions, but what it means on the, uh, for combat, for warfare, for all the stuff that NATO does, is they have generations of training, of exercise, of common doctrine, of planning, of buying equipment that talks to each, each other. And this technical inoperability that, that exists really finesses and makes it possible for countries that speak different languages and have different ways of behaving, all can pretty much operate in the battlefield with 
relatively few problems. Yes, the Americans drop bombs on the Canadians. Yes, on a different attack, the Americans shell, you know, uh, shelled uh, Canadians. Uh, it happens, but imagine how much more so would be the case if the countries didn't have a, a history of, of working together. Um, so it's no accident that the countries that Canada went with in Afghanistan were the countries that it went with in Bosnia. It was the same sector in Bosnia with the Dutch and the British, same sector of Afghanistan with the Dutch and the British. We know how they work, they know how we work, it makes things easier. Uh, when uh, we did the air campaign over Libya. At first, it was a U.S., um, uh, uh, US, French, and British operation only. And they quickly realized they needed other assets just to facilitate the communications. Uh, that they couldn't have three separate chains of command running a, uh, a bombing campaign in, air, uh, free, in a no-fly zone over Libya. They needed somebody else's headquarters to, fin to, to do all the, the, the planning, and uh, coordinating. And really, the best show in town was NATO. So the Americans were telling the French, we need NATO to do this. We can't do this by ourselves. The real puzzle of Afghanistan, the one that caused so much heartburn in this country, where, where Canadians were very critical, very outspoken, very impolite, one would say, uh, was about the Germans. Right? That in Afghanistan, there was differential burden sharing, that some countries paid a much higher price than others. That some countries were rotating commanders in and out, almost as if they were changing their clothes. That would be the Americans. And with every new general running the show, came a new strategy. So McKiernan to McChrystal, McChrystal to Petraeus, Petraeus to Allen. Every year or so, you had a new strategy. So Nipa asked me beforehand, well, was there an Afghan strategy? And I said, well, there was like five or 10 or 20 of them. You know, it, it wasn't that there wasn't one a strategy. It was too many strategies that kept changing. Um, what I'm going to talk about in a few minutes are these caveats, these, these restrictions on what you do, what you can do. Uh, the most famous one, most important one, was really that some countries were, had rules that said we cannot operate outside of our sector. And if one's original sector is in north, in the north, like the Germans or the Norwegians or the Swedes, or in uh, the west, such as the Italians and the Spaniards, and where it was less violent, it meant that those countries, with their restrictions, meant they could not be helpful in Kandahar, even when the Canadians faced a real strong crisis, like in 2006, Operation Medusa, Canada was on the phone basically saying, we need help, we need help. Some countries showed up, but many did not. And that created conflict within the alliance. Uh, countries also vary how much and how they oversee their troops on the ground. So some countries have troops that knew they could get away with violating the rules. The Dutch had pretty tight restrictions, but they also were known for not really punishing their officers who disobeyed the rules. So I have been talking to Dutch officers who would wander around Afghanistan even though we were supposed to stay in Uruzgan. Uh, and countries varied widely in the incentives they provided to their commanders. So some countries told their commanders, if you suffer casualties, you will not get promoted. On the flip side, there's Canada where almost every single Canadian commander in Afghanistan got promoted. The exceptions scream about what are the things that matter. Not about casualties, but about, well, Daniel Menard was, was fired, essentially, for sleeping with a subordinate. Uh, Pat Strogan was outspoken, and so that's why he didn't get promoted. But everybody else elevated to the highest ranks. So that tells you something. Countries varied in how they did these things. And in Libya, we saw this even more obviously than any other place, which is that there were four ways, well actually five ways, to participate in the Libyan operation. You could do absolutely nothing and stay at home. You could participate in the naval embargo. There are ships bobbing up and down in the Mediterranean, making sure that there are no weapons reaching Libya, which was kind of silly because that, the Libyans had the weapons, it was the rebels who needed the weapons, so the embargo was kind of leaky, uh, deliberately leaky. But you can be a member of NATO and say you're participating in the NATO effort by just having your ship hang out with the rest of the ships in the Mediterranean. Not very costly, not very risky. It's actually ordinary business, because right now, this day, every day, there's a, a NATO fleet off the shores of Somalia. There's a NATO fleet in the Mediterranean. The ones off of Somalia are doing counter piracy. The ones in the Mediterranean are doing counter terrorism. This is going on every day. So it actually required a real decision to say, OK, we're going to step out of the, 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 the NATO fleet in the Mediterranean. Other countries said, OK, we'll do the no-fly zone. We'll make sure that there are no planes flying over, over Libya besides NATO planes and its partners, which after the first couple days was not very risky either because the United States had taken out all the anti-aircraft uh, anti weapons, or most of them, and, and there was no Libyan Air Force anymore. 
Or you could drop bombs. Only eight countries in NATO drop bombs on Libya out of the entire alliance of 20 plus countries, 20, almost 30 countries. Um, so there's a real difference in what countries were willing to do. And so as a social scientist, I see variation and I go, this is interesting. Countries are doing different things. Why is this the case? And the first uh, assertion people make, well, it's public opinion. It's about the popularity of the mission. Those countries where, the, that where there's much more public support for the mission, they're going to let their troops do more stuff. They're not going to have as many restrictions. Uh, well, if you have sort of a, an ordinal measure of discretion from, doing, from having very tight, limited discretion to having some discretion to ha having troops that can pretty much do what you know, the NATO asked them to do, uh, and you compare it to how much of the public supports the mission, you can see there's no pattern here. There's a, you could do regressions, you could do real math, I just like to show figures. There's no correlation. Um, and in the case of Canada, there's actually an inverse relationship, which is that uh, originally the mission was very, very popular, and there was very, very tight restrictions when the Canadians first went into Kandahar in 2002 to support uh, the Americans as part of the unilateral operation during freedom. Uh, the troops had the same rules as a fighter bomber, which is if there's risk of collateral damage, you got to call home. Well, anytime a battalion, 600 guys, march out of a base, there's a risk of collateral damage. That is, you might hurt civilians. So they had to call home every time they left base. And that calling home process is not an instantaneous yes, no decision. It's you might be able to get somebody on the other end of the phone instantaneously, because we live in the 21st century. But getting an answer is not instantaneous. Uh, so often the Canadians would say, hey, wait, 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 we'll, we'll call home. And, and meanwhile, the rest of the NATO force has gone out, or the Americans have gone out. Uh, to do their operation, and the Canadians are left going, uh oh, I guess we missed that one. Uh, that was the way the rules used to be. It changed in 2005, 2006, uh, and you see the mission becoming less popular. Uh, you could su suggest there's a correlation one way or the other. I think it's more or less spurious. Um, but this was not the only case. There are other countries, too, where the, as, that there was uh, greater discretion, greater f freedom to maneuver for the commanders on the ground as the mission became less popular. The Germans reduced their caveats in 2009. The mission wasn't popular then. Uh, France uh, uh, changed how they operated in 2007. The mission wasn't pop it was less popular in 2007 than previously. So there's really not a connection between public opinion and these restrictions that I'm talking about. What about culture? Everybody would say it's the Germans. The Germans, the Germans, the Germans. Because the Germans have their past, which weighs heavily upon them. And when we, we would ask the Germans about these questions, they would say, hey, hey, you're the ones who wanted us to be pacifists. Don't complain about us when we're pacifists. Well, there's a lot of problems with that. Uh, one is that variation. There are changes over time. If you think that there's a, an embedded culture that shapes what is appropriate, what has meaning, you know, what are the norms, then you shouldn't expect to see much change. You should expect to see constant behavior. But the Germans changed their caveats over time. Again, 2009, they said, okay, we can engage in offensive operations, which were verboten before that. Um, and it also doesn't account for the non-German cases, because there are other countries in Afghanistan who weren't the Nazis during World War II, who hadn't been trained to be pacifists by the Western intervention, who had a lot of the same problems, a lot of the same kinds of policies. The Norwegians, the Swedes, the Dutch, the Italians, the Hungarians, well, the Hung Italians and Hungarians sort of on the same kind of side of World War II, but they don't have the 50 plus 60 plus years of guilt the same way the Germans do. Uh, so it's not about culture, particularly when we get change. So what is it about? Well, the first thing to keep in mind is countries are going to vary because that's what NATO, it, it, you need to have countries have freedom for NATO to operate. Why? It goes back to Article 5. Article 5 of the NATO Treaty says an attack upon one is equal to attack upon all, essentially. That's the heart of the NATO uh, uh, alliance. But as each country deems necessary. In order to get an agreement through the North Atlanta Council, you, in order to get consensus, you need to get everybody to not oppose that decision. If you asked everybody to support a decision and said, whatever our general decides, you are obligated to do with complete and total faithfulness that you cannot deviate at all, 
then they would never agree to the decision in the first place because they never want to be put in a position where their troops would be doing things that are counter to what their country wants them to do. So for NATO to work, and actually for any alliance to work or any coalition to work, countries have to have the ability to opt out or else they won't agree to participate. Um, one of the, our favorite phrases we, we heard along the way uh, about NATO is, uh, refers to force generation. Force generation is a NATO term for getting forces, troops, units, to participate in an effort. Force generation is begging, the officer put it, because they're asking for contributions to go someplace. Countries don't have to give troops or anything. You ask, you beg. And so if, they, if you were begging for troops and were saying, and we will order them around without you having any control at all, countries are not going to offer up contributions. The second thing is, is NATO is an alliance of democracies. Civilian control of the military is an overlooked but fundamental defining characteristic of democracy. We don't ask, wow, there's that debate between Bush and Gore about who's going to win the 2000 election. Let's ask the military. Nobody asked that question. We didn't think about that. We, all, we tend not to think about these questions about what the military is going to do. But for many countries in NATO, the only time their troops will ever see conflict, conflict is in an alliance of some sort, in a multilateral effort of some sort. And so they basically saying, anytime our troops are involved, we're going to give up complete control? No, that's not going to happen. So uh, countries will always try to control their troops, have some influence in how they're deployed, because whatever they're doing will have ramifications for their own country, for, their own po for the politicians from their own careers, but also for their own country. But what are these troops doing? Are they fighting for the national interest within the national rules? You know, what is the relationship between what's going on in the field and what were they supposed to be doing? What did we give them orders to do? Uh, and so that will always, there'll always be civilian control, one way or another. The question is, is the patterns of variation. Because every country behaved differently in Afghanistan. And the thing is that there's four ways to control any agent, whether that's a teaching assistant, uh, an employee at a, a, a barista in a, in a coffee house, or a military sent abroad. You select the agents. You hire people that you think are going to understand what you want, that have common interests with you more or less, and are going to follow your orders pretty closely. Um, but this choice is not available to all countries, really, when they're sending troops abroad, because th some countries have such small militaries. You know, if you're having a rotation every six months or nine months, you can't be that picky about which brigade commander you're going to send, because you only have three of them. You only have three brigades in the military, and you're sending a brigade to Afghanistan. You can't just sort of go out, beat the bushes, and put on employment ads and look for brigade commanders. You have to deal with a set. The Americans have a relatively big supply of three and four star generals, so they can change people willy nilly. But lots of other countries, particularly the smaller ones, can't be that picky. The second way, and the one that got the most attention, is discretion. How much room for maneuver. How much discretion do you give to the commanders on the ground? Do you give them lots of room so they can make up whatever, make whatever decisions they want, or do you give them very, very narrowly tailored instructions? Uh, the most obvious way this uh, took place in Afghanistan were these things called caveats, these restrictions, where, the, where commanders were told, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can do these other things. Uh, and a lot of these things were in NATO do were documents that these countries handed over to NATO, and sometimes they didn't tell NATO, and NATO commanders would discover, oh wait, these troops can't do that. And what I mean by that is they can't, you know, again, move out of their area of operation, they can't go from the north to the south, they can't engage in offensive operations, they can't fight at night, they can't fight in the snow, they can't land their helicopters within two kilometers of, of combat. You know, there are all kinds of different rules from very broad to very specific. Sometimes the NATO commanders knew what they were, sometimes they discovered them along the way. But the, the countries will vary in how tightly they, uh, um, how, much t uh, how tightly they, they, they control or guide their commanders. As I said, Canada went from, one, from having very, very tight restrictions, where their commanders have very little room to maneuver, to having quite a great deal. Um, some countries only sent, uh, one of my favorite examples is the Germans only sent six helicopters for their entire mission 
which had one fourth of Afghanistan. The upper northwestern, northeastern quadrant of Afghanistan was, was led by the Germans. Six helicopters for the entire region. If you know anything about helicopters, you know the average helicopter is broken. So if you have six, odds are you have three or four that work. And if you have another rule that says that they have to fly in pairs, that means you only have like two missions going on at the same time. And if you have rules that say you can only operate an hour away from base, which almost all countries had some sort of rule like that, golden hour, the idea to get back, you know, guys get wounded, can get back and get to, uh, uh, treatment before they die. But if you have that rule and only have finite helicopters, that means you really aren't going out very far. Uh, and on a day where your helicopters are mostly broken, you may not be going out at all. Uh, so, con so countries can tr uh, affect how much discretion their commanders have. I mentioned oversight before. Do you monitor their behavior? One of the interesting things I found along the way is that Canada varied quite significantly. Um, that for three of the years that Canada was in Kandahar, General Gautier was the commander of CEFCOM. That Hillier had set up a, uh, a, a, this, this new command, uh, Canadian Expeditionary Forces Command, whose job it was to run everything outside of Canada. And so the general, the three-star general who was running that operation was responsible for everything going on in the world, but obviously the focus was Afghanistan. Gautier visited Afghanistan 30 times over the course of three years. Imagine if you're doing your job and every other day your boss is behind your back just straying over your shoulder. That's oversight. That's very, very tight oversight. That's the effect. How closely you follow the rules, how careful you are about making sure that you know, there's, there's nothing astray. Uh, in fact, it might inhibit you from doing things because you don't want to have anything risky going on while the general's in town. Whereas his successor, Mark Lassard, was there about six times over the course of three years. So he was there every once in a while to show the flag, communicate with folks, but he wasn't in people's face all the time. So countries varied and, uh, over time and even within, uh, uh, within one mission about how tight the oversight was. Finally, as I mentioned before, how do, how do you reward or penalize performance? One of the su biggest surprises in the mission, in, in the research, was that when I was in Australia, I found out the Australian commanders were told, if you suffer casualties in your mission, you will not get promoted. And this went completely against everything that we think about Australians as being tough diggers and crocodile hunters and you know they go out and they're tough and they, they you know they, they they care about who has the bigger knife and all the rest of that stuff and the reality is is that yeah they would the infantry guys in, in Australia wanted to go and fight but their commanders like no no we're gonna have all the fighting done by the special operations forces their commandos their SAS because they were better they're better equipped they're more careful they're they're more trained they're more experienced they're also largely much more secretive. So if they do anything, if anything goes awry, it's not going to come back to the politicians back home, and they're less likely to have casualties. Which is all well and good if you, you know, 200 guys doing all the hard work and the other 1,400 guys doing just the minor stuff. That works fine, except for the fact that special operation forces are special. Special meaning small, which means that you end up having folks going over five, six, seven, eight times because those are the guys had to be rotated because there's not that many of them. Whereas there are plenty of infantry troops that could have done this mission. But uh, the, the Australians were really in a risk management mode that they were afraid to lose lives in Afghanistan. So that, changed, that affected how they operated. The good news for the Australians was they still, be, the efforts of those 200 guys there was able to carry the reputation of, Af of Australia for forward. If you talk to anybody about Afghanistan, they're like, well, the countries you could rely on were the United States, Canada, Britain, Australia. And the Australians were reliable with 200 guys out of a force of about 1,500. Uh, so it was successful. They paid as small price as possible to have the biggest bang of punching above their weight. Because every country wanted to have the label of punching above their weight, uh, except for the Americans. They just want to punch out their weight. Uh, but everybody else had that, wanted to have that reputation. Uh, so then that leads to the big social science question. What explains the variation? As a political scientist, I have to say it's institutions. And I think it is institutions. That if you compare the countries that had restrictions, most of the restrictions, and had most of the struggles in dealing with Afghanistan and dealing with other missions, the countries that had the hardest problems were the coalition governments. Because in a coalition government, you have two or more parties who have to bargain with each other 
in order to get the mission approved, and then reapproved, and then reapproved. And so if you've got two or more parties, one's going to be less enthusiastic, others are going to be more enthusiastic. The less enthusiastic one's going to say, if you want my support for this mission, we have to conduct a mission in a way that I find to be the right way to do it. If you don't want my support, if you, if you don't give me the conditions I want, I'm not going to support it. You have to find somebody else to support it or the government might, might collapse. The mission won't happen. And this is, again, not a theoretical thing. This happened with the Dutch. The Dutch had a mission, had a government fall in 2010 in the, because of this process. So in any coalition government, there's going to be bargaining about the conditions. And one of the joys of democracies is we can get those documents. And one of the joys of Google is we can translate them into English. So you dump the Dutch into, into Google Translate, psh, you get most of the specifics, then you can talk to the Dutch and they can translate the stuff that's hard to translate. But for instance, in the Dutch letter in 2006, it listed specifically those things that could go to Afghanistan. Tanks? No, we can't send tanks, because tanks are aggressive. Uh, we, in one part of the document it said, we want the Americans who are currently based in northern Oregon to stay there because that means that we're, we don't have to worry about the whole pro, that, that whole province, that uh, other folks can take care of that province, that, the northern part, the Americans. In a separate part of that document, further down, it says, but we will not cooperate with Operation Enduring Freedom. Operation Enduring Freedom was the unilateral U.S. effort that involved training and counterterrorism in Afghanistan. Well, guess what? Those Americans in the northern part of Uruzgan were under Operation Enduring Freedom. So only Americans stay in Uruzgan, but we don't want to cooperate with them. Well, how does that work in the battlefield? Because if you're pursuing Taliban and shooting at them, and somebody else shows up, you want to make sure if they're U.S. troops, you don't want to be shooting at them. So you have to do deconflicting. That is the military word for it. Deconflicting. We have to deconflict the battle space to make sure that we don't conflict with each other. We don't want to, again, have Americans and Dutch shooting at each other. Is that cooperation? Probably not. How about if the Dutch said, okay, we're going this way tomorrow, pushing the Taliban that way. You might want to know about that because then the Americans might set up on the other side waiting for the Taliban to be running towards them. Is that cooperation? Well, maybe it is. Um, so these bargains that these coalition governments created had conditions that put rules on their troops about what they could and could not do. And politicians would then interpret some of these uh, conditions very, very narrowly. So for instance, the Germans who get lots and lots of grief over this, so the Italians don't get nearly as much grief as they should get as much. Uh, the Germans, the Bundestag said that the for German forces in the north could move south and could move to other parts of Afghanistan if it was temporary, if it was uh, necessary for the success of the mission, of the NATO mission, and if only the Germans could fulfill this role. Well, the German Minister of Defense could interpret that in a variety of ways. And he chose to never send the troops down south. And they claim, we never, never asked. You talk to the Canadian defense attaches hanging out in Berlin, and we're like, we asked uh, all the time. Um, so they engage in, uh, in pretty tight discretion. How that to tight that discretion is varies significantly depending on what kind of coalition it is. Is it a purely right-wing coalition of two or three or four right-wing parties? Is it a broad coalition of left and right-wing parties? Is it uh, a narrow coalition of left-wing parties? You're going to get different kinds of conditions placed on, that, on the mission depending on what the, 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 the mixture of the folks in the coalition are. Uh, so we have pretty specific and easy predictions to make about coalition governments. Country, uh, governments where you have a president or countries where you have a single party in power, it's, we have a, it's a little harder to make predictions because then it really depends on the individual. Because the individual can make the decision. Whether the individual is George Bush or uh, Barack Obama, Chirac, Sarkozy, Stephen Harper, you know, if it's one individual making these decisions, then you have to rely on their personality. And so we focused on whether individual leaders were more willing, more focused on behavior, were they worried about their individual, con their the contingents getting in trouble, or are they more worried about outcomes? And I could talk about more of that in the Q and A, but it gets a little confusing. Uh, the key is is that the institutions of civil military relations matter a whole lot. And the general pattern that we see here is. That if you have a coalition government, you tend to have t tight restrictions, maybe medium restrictions. The big, uh, the big exception to this were the Danes. Why were the Danes so exceptional in Afghanistan? The Danes actually bled more in Afghanistan than the Canadians. 
Canadians like to say we bled more than anybody else. No, the, it was the Danes. Because they were in Helmand, and not just any part of Helmand, they were in the green zone of Helmand, which is where the poppies grow. And the poppies grow is where the, the violence was most extreme. Uh, well, why were the Danes so exceptional as a coalition government? Because uh, the, the best comparison I can make is between the Danes and the Dutch. The Danes and the Dutch both had two parties in power, a Christian Democrat party and a liberal party. And when we speak of liberal, we're talking about European liberals. So when I interviewed the, it was either the Danish or Dutch liberal, he had McCain Palin stickers all over his room. So not American style liberals, not Canadian style liberals, we're talking about right of center liberals. And so in both countries had right of center minority coalitions. Uh, Christian Democrats, liberals. In each country, the De uh, 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 Denmark and the Netherlands, they had to reach out to somebody else to get support for the mission. In Denmark, they could reach out to the Danish People's Party. Danish People's Party is further to the right. They're a xenophobic, anti-Muslim uh, party, populist party, focused on hating Muslims both abroad and at home. And so they could say, hey, we we don't like terrorists, we don't like Muslim terrorists, we'll support this mission. Particularly after the cartoon crisis. Remember the cartoon crisis of seven or eight years ago now, where there was a cartoon of Muhammad that led to all kinds of trouble? That was, that was Denmark. Uh, so, popular in Denmark to fight terrorism in Afghanistan. So you had a very narrow, ideologic, uh, uh, ideologically narrow political coalition in government in Afghanistan and in, in Denmark. They could reach out to somebody who was very similar to them. So in the bargaining process, there wasn't much demands for conditions amongst them, so the Danes could be relatively caveat-free. In the Netherlands, the equivalent party, the Party for Freedom, also xenophobic, also anti-Muslim, they weren't so interested in Afghanistan because what do populist xenophobic parties really care about? Themselves. And so a different strand of identity was about isolationism. They care about Fortress Holland, which is a really strange phrase because Holland has never been much of a fortress for anybody wanting to invade left or right. But that was their phrase, right? They, they care about Fortress Holland. And so they don't want to expend resources there. So they said, you want support for this mission, you have to go elsewhere. And so the Dutch kept having to reach to the left. These right-wing parties had to reach all the way to the left side of the political spectrum to get support. And when that happened, the, the left-wing parties would say, well, the first Labor Party, then other parties would say, if you want our support, you gotta do this, 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 and this. And that ended up producing these caveats. Uh, the other funky exception, really, to our model is Canada. Because at first we expected minority uh, governments to act more like coalition governments. Because you have to bargain all the time, right? Well, the political logic is actually a little bit different, which is that you're a minority government for a reason. Which is that the other parties can't cooperate. And so you actually have a fair amount of discretion to, to make decisions on your own. Uh, because the opposition can't cooperate. Ultimately, the opposition were able to cooperate to impose an end upon the mission, but they couldn't agree with it uh, enough to impose restrictions. There was some discussion in 2008 during the extension decision. Though some liberals said, hey, let's make sure that these guys aren't engaging in offensive operations because that's, that's what's getting them in trouble. And I, I was interviewing Rick Hillier that week, and I said, so, General, what are you going to do if that restriction gets put in place? He's like, ask me that next week. And it wasn't relevant because it didn't happen because the liberals couldn't cohere enough to impose that as a price for their support of the mission. Let's look at Libya. Libya, again, uh, instead of having discretion, it was sort of maximal effort, which, you know, if you're doing a naval embargo, there's only so much trouble you can get into. If you're doing dropping bombs, there's a whole lot of trouble you can get into. You can get shot down, you can end up dropping bombs on, on civilians. It's pretty risky. Uh, there are actually two countries that did more than this. The, the two plus signs, the French and the British, you know, the whole mantra was no boots on the ground. Well, the joke is that special operations forces wear sneakers or sandals. They don't wear boots, so they don't count. Um, so they're willing to go further. But anyway, what we see the general pattern of is that the two big exceptions to our, our theory here are the Germans. They had a right center coalition by that point in time. They had the Free Democrats and the Christian Democrats. You would have expected them to do the basic minimum. The basic minimum is always what the Germans do in NATO operations. The, being multilateral is, is a fundamental part of post World War II German identity. So, when I talk about culture, this should have made sense. Uh, Merkel decided not to get involved because she was tired of getting all the criticism for Afghanistan for sending troops, suffering casualties, and not getting any street credit in NATO for it. So, she said no. And then in her own party, we're going, what, we're not doing this? So it's actually countered her own political imperatives. Everybody in Germany were like, this is not what we should be doing. We should be doing the basic minimum. We can do the embargo, that's not a problem. 
So this was an individual politician miscalculating. Norway was interesting uh, because you had a left of Senate party supporting airstrikes. For the party politics of, of Europe, Afghanistan became tainted by Iraq. So supporting the United States in, in Afghanistan was seen as being supporting Bush to a large degree. Uh, so that led to a lot of these caveats. So left-wing parties became less in favor of Afghanistan after Iraq. Um, Libya was in, defined by many, except for Stephen Harper, as an R2P mission. So in Norway, this is popular. Left-wing parties were like, yeah, we need to do this. We need to help the Libyans out. One of the striking things is Belgium, uh, w which was a, a, a really interesting case in, in, in Afghanistan because they had officers who weren't allowed to leave their air base in, Af in, in Kabul. But there was no oversight, so the guy did. Um, because he had to go to meetings with everybody else that he had to meet with, and they didn't, weren't meeting on the air base in Kabul. Uh, but that was you know, a coalition, weak coalition that couldn't make hard decisions. What well, was interesting, in, in 2011, there was no government in Brussels. There was a caretaker government. And they're like, we really should do anything. And the parliament said, no, 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 we need to do this. And they're like, you want us to do this? We'll do, we'll do this. Because again, it was a mission that was seen as being an R2P mission. This is the kind of thing we can do. So the Belgians were one of the countries engaging in airstrikes, despite the fact that it had, been, just a few months earlier, been very tightly restricted in Afghanistan. And I can answer any questions you got about those two missions. I'm speaking long, so let me hustle through the conclusion. Uh, the implications for Canada is if, a parla you know, if, 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 if the military is making the decisions about caveats, the Prime Minister ha it will try to design the missions these days to minimize. Uh, what the, the military's decisions are. I'll talk about that in a minute uh, during Q&A. It means that we can predict what our allies are going to do, which ones are reliable and which ones aren't. Rely not... You know, people talk about the Anglosphere because it seems like all the countries that have discretion are, are English-speaking ones. But the last time I checked, the French really don't like to be considered to be part of the Anglosphere. So it's really the presidential sphere, which is really an awkward term. Um, but it's countries that have similar political institutions that are more, easy, more able to operate in the battlefield. Uh, one of the unfortunate things is that countries have decided to, you know, one way to deal with this is to rely on special operations forces because there's a lot less oversight, so you can violate the rules. There are, there are Germans outside of our regional command north. There were Norwegians outside of regional command north. They happen to have beards, they're wearing baseball hats. They were the special operations forces. But that's not very good for democratic control of the military. Uh, and the real lesson is, is that because there's uneven burden sharing, these missions become less popular which makes it harder to sustain. So the countries that, that paid a higher price are likely to say, no, you want to go to Syria? Not our job. Those guys do it. That's the Canadian response right now. You know, you, we carry the burden before, you guys do it now. Uh, for the countries that didn't bear that as much of a burden, the Germans, the Italians are like, we did so much, and we got so much abuse for it, and not much credit, we're not going to do this again. And they got the Americans who are going, what was our reaction after Kosovo that NATO's a pain and we shouldn't do this again? And so right now the lesson is don't do this again. That's one of the lessons of Afghanistan and one of the lessons of Libya is don't do this again. Which is one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why we're not doing anything about Syria because we've discovered multilateral warfare is really, really, really hard. Um, but the key thing to keep in mind is this. There's only one country, well, there's actually three countries can operate alone in the world. The Russians, the Chinese, and the Americans. For these kinds of things, we're not really usually expecting the Russians and the Chinese to be doing anything. In fact, the Chinese pretty much believe in not doing anything. Uh, so the Americans can go alone, but they've discovered that they prefer not to go alone. Iraq was a bitter experience for them for a variety of reasons, but one of them was they realized they like to have the legitimacy of NATO. They get more support from the, the, inter the international community if they have their multilateral institution along with them. It also means they can share the burden a little bit. Libya. You know, there's a whole stuff about leading from behind, but the joy of Libya for them was they did more than they wanted to, but the less than they had to. That's not right. They did more than they wanted to, but less than they otherwise would have, which is other folks are dropping bombs, other folks are doing things, they didn't have to carry the whole thing by themselves. And that was a big deal for the Americans. Uh, but for everybody else, the reality is you're always going to be operating in an alliance or a coalition of some sort. And Churchill said, two things that are applicable to this. He, have, he said the, the famous thing, which was that there's the democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. 
And he also said the uh, only thing worse than fighting with allies, because you look at the histories of World War II, lots of fights between the Americans and the Brits. In fact, in, the, in North Africa, the Brits and the, and the Americans hated each other. Um, but the only thing worse than fighting with allies is fighting without allies. So you combine those two, NATO is the worst form of international military cooperation except for all the others. And so the reality is, is that there will be a next time because politicians are going to go, that's a problem, we need to do something about it. And they're going to look to NATO because it's far more capable than these ad hoc arrangements or these other international institutions. institutions. I'll leave it at that. You've been very patient, so I'll, I'll let you guys ask questions or raise comments. Comments? Well, maybe maybe I'll start uh, just with one. I, I thought this this is a, as I said to you earlier, really well crafted book. Can't wait to read uh, the rest of it. Um, my question is this: it, it seems to me that this is not a purely institutionalist explanation. There is some culture in it, or at least political ideology. And, and it struck me when I looked at the Libya slide, those right center, right center, right center coalition governments uh, may be intimating something else. And that is that, you know, some form of pro-military or some kind of pro-American militaristic anti-Islamic politics may matter as much as the composition of the coalition or the, or the institutional variables. Now, I, I completely sympathize. If this is, mm -hmm. if this is, if there's anything to it, it would be very hard to study conceptually, operationally, etc. But it seems to me that you know, you might be giving a short shrift to culture, after all. And then the second question is realism. It's one of your mm -hmm. alternative explanations. And you, uh, you talk about Kenneth Waltz. But realism has evolved since, since then. And now we have bargaining theory and people like David Layton who are saying that we gotta pay attention to the politics of linkages. Mm -hmm. Each of these decisions are not purely domestic decisions. They involve the United States and what goes on in trade, what goes on in other issue areas. And I'm wondering if, you, if you've looked at that context, surely this must be in the rest of the book. But, you know, as you mentioned, Merkel decided to stay out of Libya because of Afghanistan. Much like with Afghanistan, could have been something else that was going on, some kind of a scandal involving, I don't know, being perceived as pro-American or anti-American. Uh -huh. So those are, those are my two questions. Uh, I don't know if someone had a follow-up on these. Perhaps you'd like to answer now or? or? Is your question along those same lines? Okay, all right. Uh, I, I, those are really good questions. Uh, I think the thing about culture is it's not nearly as binding as people have you believe. I think that the real thing that we struggled with and then figured out is that we really saw some significant changes in a short period of time. And our notion of culture is that it's something that's slower. So there are different national styles of fighting and th there are different ways that countries do things. Um, but for instance, one of the best examples is France, right? You know, so both in France and Germany, you can't use the word counterinsurgency. For France, you can't use the word counterinsurgency because it reminds people of Algeria. Algeria doesn't, is not a very pleasant memory, so nobody could call it counterinsurgency. Uh, and in Germany, you can't use the word counterinsurgency either because they did that in the Balkans, and that was pretty brutal during World War II, and so they can't use that word. And in fact, you couldn't use the word Krieg at all. There's this whole discussion in, of how to talk about Afghanistan without using the word war. Uh, you know, they would have a discussion about somebody was hurt, it was killed in a, in a crisis scenario. And that was the way the German was trying, in a crisis scenario. Every German knew there's a war over there, and indeed, eventually, politicians discovered some intestinal fortitude and started calling it a war, and that didn't change the, it didn't cause the war to fall, you know, lose popularity. It was actually, some people saw that as being actually brave and the right thing to do. It's funny because the guy who did that, uh, German Minister of Defense, Zu Gutenberg, ended up losing his job for plagiarism. So that's a lesson to all you students out there, is don't plagiarize your dissertation if you want to become member, Minister of Defense or Chancellor. That was, that was where he was going, but plagiarism killed his political career. Anyway. Um, well, we made assertions about parties based on left, right, right being more pro-military, left being more pacifist, that, that this was generically true for all democracies, uh, building on other people's works. Is this always true? Not entirely true, but generally the idea is that if you're more right-wing, you're going to be more favorably disposed to the use of force. If you're more left-wing, you're going to be more opposed to the use of force. And so the idea is the further spread out your the ideology, the 
coalition is, the more disagreement you're gonna have. And the people who have the strongest position, bargaining position, are those whose support is the weakest. Which is sort of rational choice bargaining stuff. It's just not a realist one, because we, we're talking about domestic politics here. Um, the fun part is when people talk about realism about this, is I point, you know, they say, well, this can all be true for, for Afghanistan, because nobody really cares about Afghanistan. It's really not that important. It's not an existential threat to anybody, despite what people would say. What about an existential threat? And the answer is domestic politics matters there too. So if you think back to World War, uh, the Cold War, well, for those of you who are alive during the Cold War, uh, German, the Germans, West Germans, insisted on a self-defeating military strategy. And NATO had to buy into it. How's that? There are two basic rules the West Germans insisted during the Cold War, because any war was gonna go right through the Fulda Gap. They were gonna go right through the inter-German border. The West Germans said, we will fight at the border. We will not sacrifice territory for time. Anytime you're facing a large armored thrust, which is what the Russians, the Soviets would be producing, you want to move and, 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 and actually that's how the, the Russians ultimately won, World War, you know, won their side of World War II, was being able to sacrifice space for time. West Germans said, no, we cannot give up one inch of West German territory to the Soviet invasion. We have to fight on the border, which was not the best military strategy. And they combine that with a second thing they insisted upon, which is we're not going to fortify the border. We have this border with this likely invader. We're not going to build uh, walls. We're not going to mine the border. We're not going to build all these fortifications. So the border of West Germany and East Germany, with the exception of Berlin, looks nothing at all, looked nothing at all like the North-South Korean border. That's a border that you recognize on the world, you know, from satellite. You know, you go, ah, that's the border. You know, you see the, the fortifications. The Germans, and the West Germans, insisted upon that, and this is as existential as you can get. If the Soviets invade, you're risking the end of Germany, West Germany as we know it. And the Germans are like, no, no, we're gonna, you know, these political rules are most important. So that, that's how I dispense with the, the, the larger realist argument. Uh, I think with the culture thing, there, there is obviously culture involved, there, there's, there, there, there's stuff there. It's just the patterns of variation don't seem to, to be, uh, to vary, co-vary with anything that we can code as culture. So, I mean, there's, there are cultural changes going on. So for instance, one thing that facilitates this for the Denmark is that they have this new identity as being modern day Vikings. Yes. So they, one of the big changes in, in Dutch, uh, Danish identity was they fought in Bosnia when nobody else would. They were like, well, we're gonna be in the spot, we're gonna fight, and we're gonna, we're gonna fight the Serbs and, and, and if they violate the rules, and, and they did. And so that colonel became lionized, who led that, that, that unit, uh, and they developed this identity. We can fight. And in fact, they become more pro-NATO than pro-UN pro over, over the course of time. Uh, the Dutch have a different cultural kind of thing, which is they, they were burned by Bosnia, right? The Dutch were present at Srebrenica, uh, right? Why were they pre President Sebrenica? Because the Canadians were there first, and they're like, oh crap, this is bad. So they're like, we'll move away from Sebrenica, we'll let somebody else take this. Because they realized that that situation was unsustainable. And so what happened in Sebrenica in two, 1995 was the, the Dutch unit that was protect, protecting a safe haven said, we need air support, and they called up. And at that, that time, before NATO came in, there was sort of, uh, before the Dane Accords, there was a a uh, two key system where the NATO leader had to agree and the UN leader had to agree. And the UN leader was like, no, you don't need help. And so the Dutch were overrun by the Serbs. Uh, 7,000 uh, Muslim men were, were uh, brutally killed. And six years later, I want to say, the Dutch government fell because they had a report that came out analyzing what happened and the Dutch government took responsibility. We, you know, but, so what is the Dutch lesson to be learned? Always bring your own air support. You can't rely on the international community for it. So in 2010, or 2011, when they were thinking about sending back a training mission, you know, how Canada sent a training mission back to Kabul, that wasn't gonna be combat, just training, but maintaining NATO commitment, the Dutch had the same debate, but they were just sending peace, uh, police trainers to help out the Germans, since the German police and the German army can't work with each other, uh, culture. Um, and so the Dutch insisted, the Dutch parliament said, okay, you're bringing either four or six, I forget which, F-16s to, to Afghanistan with you for your police mission. Because if you're in real trouble, you want to be able to call on 
Dutch planes because they'll answer your call even if the NATO chain of command says no. So there's a police training mission with fighter planes attached to it, which makes no sense except for it's sort of this cultural shared understanding that we can't trust the international community. So there, there is culture involved in, involved in this, certainly. But we like to think that the major variations are due to institutions and then other, other stuff as well. My name's uh, Josh Libin. I'm a PhD student here at University of Ottawa. And uh, my own research is, uh, involves uh, United Nations peacekeeping and troop contribution uh, variation between countries. And I'm wondering if, um, obviously, the fourth generation uh, process is very different at NATO as compared to UN peacekeeping, but uh, would you, would your theory, would you think that your theory would apply your focus on domestic institutions to uh, UN peacekeeping or other forms of uh, multinational intervention? Absolutely. Um, now we we didn't study any UN specific cases, but I'm sure if we went back and talked to all the folks about Bosnia '92 to '95, we'd find that countries had different kinds of 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 behavior on the ground. Um, and we can take a look at other NATO operations. I, I think one of the, the challenges for NATO, I, I mean, UN, I think one of the things that makes the UN missions different is there's, is there's not a clean uh, division of labor and identity of who's doing what in a UN mission as opposed to a NATO mission, where you actually have all the NATO documents that tell you, okay, this is, this is where the country X is, this is where country Y is. One of the fun things about Libya was they stopped producing those kind of placemats after the first one because they didn't want to point the fingers at everybody. But you can still get the placemats of, 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 uh, of the Afghanistan mission and should know where everybody is in Afghanistan. Uh, they're online. Type in NATO placemat, you'll find it. Um, so I think for the UN, there's a lot less clarity about it. Uh, but you saw in Somalia that countries had different rules of engagement. And that's one of the things that made Black Hawk Down that day so very, very difficult because the Italians had their rules and the Pakistanis had their rules, the Americans had their rules, actually different American units had that separate rules. And they hadn't come together and really coordinated how to deal with these things. One of the differences between the UN and NATO is that when... Uh, Canadian uh, Brigadier General Jocelyn Lacroix was running Kabul. He was the NATO commander for Kabul when NATO was really Kabul plus a little bit around it. He brought in every one of his 28 different commanders under him and said, I want you to provide me with what you would do in this scenario, this scenario, and this scenario. If you, go, if you have to go home and get information from, and get authorization from your higher ups, do so. But then those, all of those commanders went back to their, their, their home uh, headquarters, said, what can we do in scenario X, scenario Y, scenario Z? Then they all came back and had a meeting, and everybody sort of briefed everybody else, here's what we can do, here's what we can't do in each of these scenarios. So that way there wouldn't be surprises. Um, and I don't think that the UN really has that kind of process. It probably varies from mission to mission, but I don't think UN, the UN has the same kind of lessons learned, institutionalized kind of way of doing things that where those lessons can be shared in the same way that NATO does. Uh, so I would think that, NATO, that they do have some of these same differences, but I don't think you get quite the same visibility because there's not quite as much of a tie between this is my contingent and this is, is what the risks are. Um, but you know, we saw that happen in, in, in Rwanda. The Belgians you know, said, okay, we lost, what was the number, 11 Belgians the first day? And the Belgian government said, you're coming home. That's the national command chain saying, forget what the international organization says, you're coming home. You're no longer be doing this stuff. So you still have national command even in a UN operation. Nipa. Um, Steve, you mentioned, I don't need it. Really. <laughs> well, they're recording it. Um, uh, you mentioned about burden sharing and a lot of the countries, I don't know if you were focusing on Afghanistan, in Afghanistan burden sharing. Now, if the burden sharing, the countries are complaining about it, or saying that you know we share too much burden, they had their choice. They made their selection of the provinces they wanted to go to. And in particular, Canada, and you've mentioned that, that the forces, they did not have adequate equipment, forces, etc., to handle a province like Canada. Like Uruzgan, um, Helmand, and um, Kandahar were the most difficult areas. And whoever went there, they selected their own. Canada didn't have to go there, nor did 
Netherlands. I mean, they went to Uruzgan, which was a difficult province, as well as the Brits have had a terrible time in Helmand. I mean, they, they lost it, basically, and so did Canada, and Netherlands left. So uh, this burden-sharing issue, how do you look at it? Like, you know, I mean, should they be talking like that? And they were given a chance to assess um, a province where they decided to go. They went for their own profiles. Canada definitely did. I do not know about others as much, but Canada went for the, to raise their profile, Hillier and foreign affairs. Uh, it's a good question. I mean, part of it is that countries, when they went into Afghanistan, that there, there was understanding that the South was going to be harder than the North. There was not understanding how much harder it was going to be. Uh, so you could say, why complain about burden sharing? Because, you know, you chose your fate, suck it up. I mean, that, that's basically what your question is. Uh, and there's something to that, but on the other hand, you're part of an alliance and you expect allies to help you when you're in trouble, you expect to help allies when they're in trouble. And Canada, when it was in Kandahar, was willing to go to Helmand to help out the British, which they did a lot. They did go, they said, did send troops out to Helmand, uh, to Urzgan and Fairmount to help them. They went to Zabul and helped them. The Danes were willing to cross barriers to help out. Uh, some, some countries were willing to do this. And so it wasn't that the Canadians were asking the Germans always to move, you know, to come down south and be there forever. They were just saying, when we need help, could you come and help us out? But the Germans were in the north. The Germans were in the north, but they can get in a plane, right? They, the, you know, the Germans had, actually, one asset that did go all over Afghanistan. They were, they were one of the principal suppliers for a lot of the, the, the tactical support, the, the, the medium kind of, of planes that were flying around the country. Uh, so they could have put a bunch of Germans, sent them south. I mean, the Dutch, they're like, we can't really fight in, in, in Panjway, but what we'll do is we'll, we'll come from Oruzgan and we'll man your base in Kandahar, so I'll free up more of your forces to go out there. That was help. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's part that, that after these controversies, NATO had summits where they negotiated with this, and, and Germany and Italy and other countries said, okay, from now on, in extremists, if there's an emergency, we'll come. And the Italians even said, we've reduced our decision-making process from 72 hours to 24 hours. So it's all good. And what happened? Have we ever seen Italians hanging out in regional and south when things got hot? No. Did we see the Germans move there? No. We did see the French. Uh, that in the aftermath of the first prison break, um, the Afghans and the French were mentoring, moved into the Argadab region uh, under the command of a Canadian general. And the French had to call home for permission to move from where they were to, to the province of Kandahar. That took 24 hours. So the American Marines went in and were their mentors that day. They failed because it wasn't that relationship with trust. The next day, the French show up because the phone caller Sarkozy ended with ADS. But Steve, these countries, I mean, either it's uh, Netherlands or uh, Canada and the Brits, did they not know that this is the way Alliances worked in the past. Uh, yes and no. I mean, they understood that there were problems with alliances, but they also thought that that the countries had made a significant commitment to each other, and they expected some significant help when things got really hot. Uh, and they didn't get it. I mean, they got it from some countries. So, for instance, Operation Medusa, Canada was not alone. The Americans showed up. The Brits showed up. The Danes showed up. Some other countries showed up. Uh, but prior to Afghanistan. One of the countries that had the best reputations for being an effective military in NATO were the Germans. They had, through most of their time, the third largest contingent in Afghanistan. So they had the most excess capacity to go from where they were to someplace else. And the Italians were number four. Um, and a part of, it's a political problem, which is in Canada, you know, you'd have the critics of the mission go, we're bleeding more than the Germans and the, and the, uh, and the Italians. That's unfair. So even if Martin knew what he was getting into, uh, even if Harper knew what he was buying into when he became prime minister, there was still a political process here that shaped perceptions about the mission. I mean, my starting point was Canada's not alone in Afghanistan, not alone in Kandahar. Why should I say that? I shouldn't have to say that. It should be, everybody should know that Canada was part of a NATO operation and the NATO operation was blessed by the UN. It was all supported by UN resolutions. 
But because of the way it played out, it seems like Canada was alone in Kandahar. Kandahar was the only place that bad things were going on because that's all that was covered in, 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 in Canada. Uh, had the Germans carried more of their burden, then it would have taken away one of the points of the opposition to the mission. There are good reasons to oppose a mission in Afghanistan. There are bad reasons to oppose a mission in Afghanistan. There's good reason to support it. There are bad reasons to support it. Uh, so you can go either way on the issue. I'm not going to say how to think about it. But the fact that there was uneven burden sharing complicated the politics for those who were doing more than their share. It also complicated the politics for those who were doing less than their share. Um, but it's, you're right, it's inevitable in any NATO operation. It's inevitable in any co -alliance, uh, coalition operation. Remember World War II. Uh, Joseph Stalin was yelling for years for a second front to be opened up in Europe because the Russians were bearing too much of a, a burden for World War II. How many Russians died in World War II? 20 million. How many Americans died in World War II? Less than a million. He wanted an invasion of France in 1942, which would have failed. Um, and he kept on demanding that because there was an uneven burden sharing. And it's not as if Joseph Stalin had a domestic audience he had to pay attention to. Uh, but for those who do in modern democracies, this is a real problem. And yeah, it's not that unpredictable, particularly after everybody reads my book. Um, but it's st still, when you're thinking about engaging these missions, you don't, the, the, the politicians aren't thinking through every possible thing. Uh, and they expected to get help. And they got some help, but John, not, just not as much as they would have liked. They got a lot from the U.S. They got a lot from the U.S. But, you know, for the first five or six years, the United States was focused elsewhere, um, which was an American problem. But it became an alliance problem because the Americans were playing around in Iraq and weren't, you know, if the American, you know, the lot, one of the big regrets about Afghanistan, obviously, is if the Americans had stuck around in, in Afghanistan and dedicated a real effort in 2002, 2003, 2004, you might have had different outcomes. But we'd still have Karzai, we'd still have Pakistan, we'd still have Poppy, so, you know, who knows to say that things would play out wonderfully had the Americans stuck around. <coughs> but clearly that made it worse. Uh, there's lots of alliance politics works out there that talk about the problems of allies. But again, I would go back to Churchill. He's right. Absolutely right. More questions? Sure, there's one back there. <coughs> he's got a microphone. Oh, he's got We've got two mics today. Yes. And one. Okay, well, thank you. I just want to thank you for the presentation. And I was just wondering that without taking away your theory about how domestic politics influence on how the commitment that was engaged in Af Afghanistan and subsequent to Libya, I was just wondering how much the influence of uh, the decision of different government have on another one, because you're talking about the democratic institution in which, for example, a coalition government, a majority parliament, or a Turk caretaker government, how much that influence on other commitments is going to play. But what about the commitment that other countries are taking? Like you just said about the United States being very involved in Iraq and not taking that much support in Afghanistan or having different countries having more support than others. How much that could have inflected that the mentality of, okay, they're doing more than their commitment is larger than what we're willing to go, so we're going to take less commitment because we don't have to. So I just want to know what you think about this thing, theory. Well, I think these commitments are interrelated. And so one of the debates in Canada is, you know, we, got, we chose Kandahar because we didn't choose Iraq, right? That countries, I mean, the, real re, the, the, real, the reason why everybody went to Afghanistan, everybody, everybody, and I do mean everybody, and everybody in NATO went. Some had very token contributions, the, the Greeks. And for a long time there, they had 15 guys in Afghanistan. And they had one of the largest militaries in NATO, but they sent 15 guys, so that's like the worst proportion of, you know, it's one thing to have, you know, three Icelanders or, 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 or two Estonian, and actually Estonians have, you know, 100 guys there. But um, these things are related. The, the, the countries went to Afghanistan because of the commitment to the United States. Uh, Australia showed up. Australia doesn't care about Afghanistan. Australia's not a member of NATO. New Zealand went. Why? Because they were, all these countries were making, a, uh, were trying to fulfill a commitment to the United States because they all think that someday they might need the United States. And so the Australians put it to me very clearly. We're putting money into the American Bank of Credit. So that way, someday when we need them, we'll have earned enough credit that they come out and help us. 
I mean, the, the irony of all this is that the NATO treaty, Article 5, was not designed for everybody to protect the United States. That was not the purpose of that treaty. The purpose of that treaty was to get the United States to protect everybody else. Uh, this is why Georgia wants to get to be a member of NATO. Georgia's not trying to become a member of NATO, so it could, it could defend the United States. And so there is something to the idea that some countries need NATO more. So, for instance, one of the largest, it used to be that Australia was the largest non-NATO member, non-NATO non partner in the mission. The country that holds that title now is Georgia. Uh, and we, we saw that in the Balkans to a certain degree when a lot of the countries that were trying to get in NATO were trying to send as many troops as they could to the Balkans in, in uh, the Bosnia Stabilization Force or in the Kosovo K4. They were, you know, the, the Czechs and the Hungarians and the, and the Bulgarians were all doing this because they want to become members of NATO. Uh, because when you're a member of NATO, then you don't have to worry about the big bear anymore. That's, that's, that's really still it. It's still it. It's still really about Russia for NATO. For Australia, New Zealand, it's about China. So there are these realist games going on, no doubt about it. That we can't explain, we, we don't, we're not trying to explain why countries show up at all. We're just showing, we're trying to explain what the, how they manage the troops once they show up. But there's a lot of alliance games going on here. So there are linkages, there are trade-offs being made. So, hey, I gave you troops to uh, Iraq, is that enough? And it turns out it wasn't enough because everybody who went to Iraq also showed up in Afghanistan. Not everybody who showed up in Afghanistan went to Iraq. So in Iraq you had, uh, the Australians and the Brits and uh, the Dutch and a few other countries. They all left quickly though because that wasn't really the NATO operation. The NATO operation, everybody stuck it out until at least 2010. And almost everybody stuck it out to 2013. The only early departers were the Dutch and the Canadians. And both of those went back. Both of those countries went back in 2000, you know, um, I wanted to write a paper about it referring to, to Afghanistan as Hotel California. Because you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. Uh, and that's the case in Afghanistan because the Dutch left and went back. The Canadians left and went back. Only in 2013, 2014, when everybody's leaving, can you leave and not come back. Because only then has you, have you completely fulfilled your commitment to NATO. Because someday you may need NATO. Um, however, we think in the terms of the stuff we talk about, it's not proximity to the Russian bear that shapes caveats, because you'd expect the Polans and the Germans to be far more enthusiastic than, you know, the French. Uh, you know, you can do that kind of thing. But the Turks, who are the closest to the Russian bear, actually had really tight restrictions. And part of that's culture, because they don't want to be at war with fellow Muslims. They're not a pacifist country. They're plenty fine having war with their own Kurdish citizens. Um, but their restrictions were based on other stuff, particularly when you have a Muslim party running the country. So, um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yes? Uh, if I can ask a, a couple of questions. The first one is kind of a, a jump on on that, and is whether or not your research showed that, that kind of attitude among militaries. So, for example, did the Canadians notice that the Germans weren't coming south, or that the Germans never came south. Um, and then the second one was that, I hate to keep picking on, on Germany here, but you, you mentioned that, that Merkel was a little bit upset that Germany wasn't getting the credit for what it did in, in Afghanistan and therefore didn't participate in Libya. Did What were the consequences of that, both within NATO and then maybe politically at home? Sure. Um, so the, the, I'll ask the second question first because that's one I, I still remember. Uh, and I'll get back to the first one once you remind me of what it is. Uh, were there consequences to, at home? She faced some criticism domestically. She lost some credit with her own party. Uh, that you know, She faced some you know, rumbles, but it didn't lead to them going, well, we need to have a new party leader. So it was minor, but it was a, it was a significant hit on her reputation as being a competent foreign policy leader for violating basic rules of German foreign policy, which is always join the coalition when it goes places, just don't necessarily be in the front. Um, internationally, I think there are consequences. The real test is ahead, because we're about to find a new Secretary General for NATO. And there's a lot of talk last summer about it would be the former Defense Minister of Germany. And I was like, how can you have the Germans do this when they just opted out of a NATO operation in Libya, and before that were less than, uh, 
reliable partners in Afghanistan. Uh, how can you possibly do this? And so recently, on his way out of office, the German defense minister was yelling and complaining about the Brits and the French. So I think he's, he's read the tea leaves and has realized he's not going to be Secretary General of NATO because you cannot become Secretary General of NATO having uh, taking shots of the, uh, the British and the French. It's just not going to happen. So I, I think that is one consequence, that Germany was probably going to have, the, have that position as, as Secretary General of NATO, because it always rotates among some European country. The Americans always have the military guy. Uh, the SAC here, the, the, the Secretary General is always a uh, European civilian. So I think that they took that hit. And I do think that as the mission went along, Germany lost influence over you know, how that mission was conducted, that, that <coughs> They didn't get the prime uh, billets, prime jobs within NATO, that they weren't a strategy maker, they were a strategy taker. So when you had a meeting about how to figure out what was gonna go ahead, uh, the US would say, okay, we're gonna make the most of the decisions, but we'll bring in the, the Brits, we'll bring in the Canadians, because you know they've, they've been doing their fair share. But the Germans weren't invited to those meetings. Uh, when I was in the Pentagon in 2001, 2002, there was a Quint meeting. NATO is a big organization, so they always subdivide when they want to make decisions. So the quint was the United States, Great Britain, Italy, France, and Germany. Five, the five biggest contributors to Bosnia and, and Kosovo operations. They were the ones invited to the meeting. It was called the quint, five. The Canadians were not even at the kids table. They were not invited to the meeting. And so if you're a smaller mission, in the past, it was just about size. If you're a smaller mission, you don't get to shape strategy, you just get to take it. In, in, Bosnia, in, in, in Afghanistan, it wasn't just how big your mission was, but what it was doing. If you're willing to bleed and lead, well, if you're willing to bleed, you get to lead more. Uh, and so I think that, that mattered for that mission. And I think it also mattered for NATO's doing all kinds of stuff every day, who has heft, who has power, has influence. Uh, I think Germany has a lot less influence in NATO headquarters these days than it used to. And Canada has more. Now that, that's a, that's a it's not going to last forever. People have short memories. The political capital goes away. Uh, but I think for the medium term, it, you know, Canadians made a difference, and, and they were rewarded for it with more influence in, in, in NATO. And I think uh, the opposite is true for, for the Germans. Uh, the first part of the question was... It was it was kind of trying to get at your mili your civil military. Oh sure sure. Uh, the, so uh, did the Canadian military guys perceive this? Absolutely. I talked to one. Mil you know, Canadian military representative who served in Berlin, who was sort of supposed to engage the, Ber the Germans about these things. He was very passionate. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I, it, Rick Hillier was very aware of it. In fact, uh, the Canadians had this, you know, said, you know, Hillier th had reduced most of the caveats or restrictions, but there were a few left. The Germans said, you've got caveats too, so don't complain about ours. So he went ruthlessly through and went, okay, what is there that we can't do in Afghanistan that the Germans could point to as a caveat? And the one thing that was left outstanding was crowd control, that the Canadians couldn't do crowd control. They couldn't, you know, if there was a potential protest or riot, the Canadians weren't supposed to get involved in that. And he said, forget that. He talked to the Minister of Defense and said, we're getting rid of that caveat, and the Minister of Defense said, all right. And I mean, that was the way the process worked. It was really mostly, I mean, the wonderfully interesting part of the Canadian story was almost, all these decisions were almost all made within the military. It wasn't made by the Minister of Defense, it wasn't made by Harper, most of these things, almost all intra-military. Uh, so the story about Canada is more of a generational change in the Canadian military than anything else. Um, but Hillier said, okay, we're gonna get rid of it, and psh, that caveat was gone. And I found out about that because I sort of experienced that as I was traveling through Afghanistan. I went, hey, there's crowd control equipment. I was like, can you do that? Well, yeah, we can. It's like, so when I interviewed Hillier, I said, I thought this was a caveat. He said it used to be. Because he was trying to tell the Germans to screw off, essentially. More questions? Nope, 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 nope. There's one over here. One, oh. one last question. Sorry. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Just, uh, sure. Um, just to... Perhaps just a question about, well, kind of picking up on some themes that were floating around, mm -hmm. um, about how these, a lot of these outcomes, it strikes me, and it seems to come up even in your presentation, the examples that you give, where, you know, a lot of these things are path dependent. The, a lot of the things that are happening, a lot of the decisions about, you know, troop deployment, levels of commitment, what type of effort, and so on, depends on what previous conflicts have happened, what the experience has been from that, your example with Merkel, um, or that even this type path dependence can occur over the, with the change over the course of how a particular conflict is interpreted, like Afghanistan being changed in the midst of it by the experience in Iraq. Um, or, you know, what, I mean, why was, 
you know, why was Libya okay to do? Well, the broader context in which it's happening, the Arab Spring and so on, of course, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. there, there, there's, there, it's, it's, it's a good thing to do. So that even changes the calculus. You know, normally left-wing governments, it's not good to do a military mission. But if it's or, you know, promoting humanitarian intervention in the context of an Arab Spring, then it becomes a good thing to do. Um, so I'm just wondering if you know the, 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 this kind of historical mm -hmm. uh, contingency from one from one mission to another um, may actually affect the kinds of decisions that are happening. I definitely think the past matters. Uh, I, I mean, there is learning. There's absolutely learning. So, I mean, I, I do think one of the reasons why Canada went to Kandahar was partly because other countries that Canada operated with were all going to the same part of, the, of Afghanistan. So they'd rather work with the Dutch and the British, who they're familiar with, than the Italians. And I think that if you got, you know, a Canadian officer drunk down the byward and said, how would you like to operate with the Italians? They would probably tell you the truth that, no, they wouldn't want to hang out with the Italians. I mean, the, one of the Italian restrictions were that they, they wouldn't allow Afghans on their helicopters. So you can, you know, imagine an operation where the Italian is hurt, an Afghan is hurt, the Italian guy gets put in a helicopter and is back in a hospital in an hour, the Afghan has to ride in a truck for, you know, 10 hours to get to a hospital. You know, is that the way to do, you know, mentoring? Um, so there, there's all kinds of, you know, pick your things about this stuff. This, it's, this stuff gets very fine-grained, so uh, I bumped into a, a British pilot in Bagoville because I, there was an air show in Bagoville. I went there because I wanted to interview the pilots because some of the pilots were, had just come back from Libya. It was still while Libya was going on. And one of the pilots was a Brit. And he was like, well, I've actually got two chains of command watching me because I've got to follow the British rules of engagement and I've got to follow the Canadian rules of engagement and they're different. I'm like, you all have one queen, so how could they be different? And of course, Phil's not here, so I, he can't be outraged by the concept of one queen. Um, but the idea is that even with that cultural similarity, you'd have differences. But then there's bigger differences because of path dependence of all the decisions made in the past. So the Dutch have learned decisions about how to fight the last war this time, so they bring their F-16s on a police mission. Uh, the Germans have, you know, there, there, are, there is these lessons, but the way they play out is, is through politics. And so the, the restrictions always get tighter the broader the coalition is because each party learns different lessons from the previous operation. And so if you've got uh, a tightly uh, tight coalition of, of similar thinking parties, there's not going to be that many con conditions because they'll agree to the same thing. But if you have very different parties, they will learn very, very different lessons. When you talk to the Democrats or Republicans about Vietnam, you still get different answers about what went wrong there. And you'll get, you know, you talk about the surge. I had a class yesterday about counterinsurgency. What is the lesson to learn from the surge? Was it the additional troops? Was it the new counterinsurgency doctrine? Was it just all about the awakening and we got lucky? Was it that ethnic cleansing happened uh, so we got there at the right time? That is that there was less fighting to be done, uh, that there's a right time to be showing up for ethnic cleansing. Um, and you'll learn, you know, the parties will learn whichever lesson that fits their own predispositions, right? Um, so there will be evolution over time and people will learn lessons. But each party will learn different lessons. So the next time around, there'll still be a bargaining process. The way that bargaining process plays out will be different because the lessons will be different. Uh, but there will still be this bargaining process. It's harder for coalition governments. Um, there is path dependence here. I mean, I didn't get into the French story, but Sark, you know, Chirac was opposed to helping, out the, to helping out the Americans in any visible way after 2003. So you had a very, very visible peacekeeping force in Kabul that didn't do anything, and a very, very invisible special operations force doing a whole lot in actually where the Canadians ended up moving to. Then when Sarkozy comes in, he's like, I want to do something completely different. I'm not burned by Bush. I'm not burned by Iraq. I love NATO. And so he completely changes things overnight. And they're in the exact same part of, part of the political spectrum. So it's, you know, part of that is not about parties. It's about individuals, and that's where individuals become, you know, semi-unpredictable. Uh, it's about, you know, have they been burned in the past by delegating? If they have, then they have focused more on behavior. If they haven't been burned in the past by delegating, they're more likely to delegate more because they're more focused on getting the outcomes. Uh, and so you'll see learning back and forth. Rumsfeld sometimes micromanaged, sometimes he let things go. And when he micromanaged, he really micromanaged. When he let things go, he really let things go. So uh, 2003, he's like, Afghanistan, pff, I don't care about that. I'm running a war in Iraq. And so an American general who was responsible for the American effort in Afghanistan at the point in time said, hey, we have to do counterinsurgency. And so he's doing counterinsurgency. All that clear hold build, you know, security pillar, governance pillar, you know, all the usual rhetoric stuff. And, and then, then Rumsfeld was like, you're doing counterinsurgency? I don't want you to be doing I want you to be counterterrorism. I don't want you to be doing that. And so he, for a long time, he had weekly um, 
secure video teleconferences with that general every week going, what are you doing? Tell me exactly what you're doing, every, every bit of your thing, and would just abuse the crap out of that, that, that general for an hour or so on this conf video conference, making sure that he did not exceed his authority. Because he didn't want any counterinsurgency being done. He just wanted the basic minimum so that way he could keep his eye off of Afghanistan on, on Iraq. Um, so, the, you know, when we, when we start talking about individuals, we as political scientists get in lots of trouble because uh, we don't have as good theories uh, that are not circular, not tautological. Uh, but, um, yeah, the, the, the past doesn't matter. And I, I mean, and that was a lesson in, Af in Olivia, right? No boots on the ground. They learned the lesson. They still had the same NATO problems, but they just did it differently. No boots on the ground. And the lesson for Syria is no boots on the ground, no planes in the sky, I guess. I mean, it's, it's just that they learned that Libya was a mixed outcome. I mean, they did, NATO did what it was supposed to do, and then some. It changed the government. Part of that could have to do with the strategy, too. I mean, in the beginning, you know, the strategy in Afghanistan was really different. You know, it was, you know, air war get the Northern Alliance and a lot of the clans to do the, the, the fighting on the ground and so on. The idea that, you know, perhaps the people you're working with may be just as bad as, as, as the enemy, you know, Libya and then, and then Syria, the, 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 the idea that, you know, chemical weapons, I mean. We had, you know, uh, when I was in the, in the Joint Staff in 2001, people were going, the Kosovo Liberation Army, and how reliable are those folks? I mean, they, they were, you know, some, they had good suspicions that the Kosovo Liberation Army was not really about liberating Kosovo, but about creating porous boundaries to facilitate uh, crime, smuggling, because the Balkans are a really good location for moving poppies from, Pac from Afghanistan, it's all one big happy story, uh, to, to Europe. Well, actually, cigarette smuggling. That was actually the big industry in Montenegro, right? Uh, so it's about smuggling. Um, uh, the Coastal Liberation Army was a mixture of people. You know, the, the days of having folks in the ground that we utterly love and have complete faith in, you know, where is that? I mean, we, we, you know, during World War II, it was easier because, you know, we had all these democracies that were overrun by Germany, so the, the, we depended upon, you know, the French uh, resistance. And that was great until we actually had to deal with De Gaulle. <laughs> You want to talk about alliance problems? Just read the stuff about De Gaulle, about the Americans and the British having to deal with De Gaulle. They did not like him at <laughs> all. And there was some serious, serious bargaining problems on the ground uh, between them about where to go, you know, timing and where to go and who was to bear responsibilities. And that was the good guys that weren't tainted by all that organized crime stuff in, in Kosovo or tainted by all that warlord stuff in Afghanistan. Um, I mean, the, the reason why we're not in Syria is you're right. There's just not a local ally we want. We can hang a hat on. And that's that. I think that that is. You know, Afghanistan is about one third of the story. Austerity is about one third of the story. And I think the fact that we have no local ally that we at all have any comfort level with at all is one third of the story. There's a lot of good reasons not to be in Syria. Very few good reasons to be there besides the real humanitarian disaster that it is. But you know. Do no harm, I guess, is the first rule. Last question? Anyone? This was great. Great presentation. Great time for Q&A that you left to us. Join me in thanking uh, Steve Sadler.